So in this segment, we're going to be talking about Byline Times doing some excellent reporting here, um, talking to some of the wheel steel workers around Port Talbot who have, um, I think, been made unemployed um, due to the steel mills, uh, steel factories closing. Um, it's a really bad situation for the UK, where I think we'll be one of the only G20 uh, countries that cannot produce its own steel. And there's been a long going debate with, I think, Tata Steel and a few other companies. Um, and it's just a complete disaster. So uh, really massive credit to Byline um, for doing you know, good journalism, going first hand reporting, which is something we don't see enough of from the mainstream media outlets like the BBC. Um, and so you should support the Byline Times. I do uh, direct support. And I think... Um, you know, if you, if you have the capabilities to do so, you should do it because this is um, this kind of work costs money and um, it's really good stuff. I love the stainless steel works. I love to be given the opportunity to carry on working there. But I just don't know the moment. But the Tories were the ones that promised to save steel. Yeah. But nothing has come to fruition. I say lot, there's, not, there's not a lot of opportunities left and in this area. voted Conservative in the past? Yes. When? I think it was Brexit, did. And did you vote really? Yes. What was the main reason? Well, it was, um, you see, I, I see the European Union, there's a lot of, un well, a lot of them are unelected, or I don't know. It's not even true, to be fair. It's not really. If you know your local European, you, when we was in there, your local European uh, MEP, nobody does. Yes, because no one, no one took it seriously, that's why. It was a joke. It was an absolute joke. That's why we treated it as a joke. Um, that was the problem, you know. It's one of the reasons why Nigel Farage and, and the UK party did so well in it, because no one cared. It was never. It was ever explained to anyone why the uh, European elections are important. So you voted Brexit. How do you feel about that vote now? Would you have done it differently? Probably would have done it differently. You know the way the world's going because it's a lot more unstable than it was seven years ago. Not wrong. You see, you think the Tory party. You think of a party who are concerned with business, and the the, the, the party that does. Well, Boris Johnson famously said, "F business." Business. So financially, you know, this party. You think that, and you see Labour as some sort of socialist and the other trade unionist sort of party, and you think you get more done with the Tories, and that hasn't happened. I mean, Labour being socialist, Labour have been socialist for a long time now, a long time. You know, trade union is sure, but you know, a trade union would have fought to protect your jobs as best they can. I reckon they did. A trade union would have fought as hard as they could to protect the um, the jobs in Port Albert. You know, so this idea of being anti-union, um, especially when you work in the manufacturing sector, makes absolutely zero sense. They haven't created any jobs. Why do you think that? Like the Tories, and that hasn't happened. They haven't created any jobs. Why do you think that? Like a lot of these uh, the people who work there, they've been there 30 odd years. I say they might have children who are about to win, uh, embark on like, in a career in the industry, and now they can't. So th they feel like their future has been ripped away. They feel like they, you know, they got their offspring's uh, future has been ripped away. So uh, the, it's rock bottom. Well, it's a, it's the chief employer. It's the biggest employer. Um, see a lot of workers there. The second, third, fourth generation employees of the steelworks, which different forms of chorus, British steel, whatever. You, you, you're reducing the numbers massively. What Port Talbot do you think is next year? Derelict. And this this will be the death, I think, of this area. I remember Phil talking about it, and he goes, um, you know, the, the local economy is very dependent on the uh, steelworkers. And it's going to have massive ramifications because um, they would be paid, I think, decent wages and they'd be able to spend that money, especially in the local economy. Like, it's going to be a complete disaster. We saw that in Swindon when they closed the, I think it was Nissan. I'm going to say it was Nissan. It's one of the Japanese car makers. And they were talking to the workers there and they couldn't get anywhere near the wages they were getting at other companies. They would have to take tremendous pay cuts. And again, that's a massive knock on effect, especially on the local economy, not just the exchequer, but the local economy is the thing you worry about um, because that leads to more and more jobs going. It's a huge problem. Um, and so a lot of the kind of Brexiteers try to blame net zero, which has been completely da um, destroyed by the ex, um, I think this would be the ex first minister for Wales. Conservative MPs and Brexiteers like Nigel Farage in the last couple of days has blamed the closure of the steelworks on um, net zero hysteria or climate policy. How much truth is in that? None. It's a simple answer. Why is it that the Netherlands plant at Aymuden and Tata's operations elsewhere in the EU are not being affected and yet it's the UK's operations and particularly those in Wales that are taking the brunt of the redundancies? We've seen what's happened within the EU, we've seen what's happened in the UK, why the difference? And that's a big question and I think that's a question where you know they keep blaming net zero but other countries have I think net zero targets as well.
Behind me is the largest steelworks in Britain, and it's just announced that it's closing. For the last 24 hours, the entire British media have been here reporting. But if you watch their coverage, none of them are asking why it's closing, why it's happening. It's a significant moment in British manufacturing, and no one's asking why. If you turn on GB News, if you turn on right-wing commentators, if you listen to Tory MPs, they'll tell you it's because of net zero hysteria. So no one seems to know what's going on. But there's one person who does, Carwin Jones. He was the first minister of Wales from 2009 to 2018. He oversaw all of the transition period post Brexit. He oversaw the major meetings that happened at Tata. So this is the truth about why that plant has closed down. In 2016, there was certainly a change in terms of the UK government's uh, activity around Tata. Pre the Brexit referendum, they were very active. Uh, Sajid Javid and I went to uh, Mumbai. We talked to, uh, to Tata after the referendum. Zero interest in the steel industry, and that, I'm afraid, has remained the case since. When you were first... Perhaps I saw the writing on the walls, because there was the whole thing about Minford, Patrick Minford, the economist, saying, like, some of these industries will fail. So they knew this from the jump, and it might have been why they abandoned the steel industry in the first place. As Minister, you would have been having conversations with people at the top of Tata, with government ministers, for, for years post-Brexit. How often do these concerns come up in those, in those meetings? If you're a business, you want certainty, first of all. You need to know that there is an agreement in place. Whether you like it or not, at least it's there. And you know that you can shape your business accordingly. At the moment, because there are so many siren voices in the Conservative Party that are looking to shape Brexit in their own particular way, there's no certainty. Uh, who is going to invest in the UK if they can't have certainty uh, for the future? And of course, Brexit has created all this uncertainty, then of course, magnified by the failures of successive governments in London to, to, to take a decision and stick to it in terms of our trading relationship with Europe. Why is it that the Netherlands plant that I moved in and Tata's operation in there that I think needs to be addressed? Well, when you leave one of the world's biggest markets, it's inevitable that you will not have the same ability to export unless you put in place a series of arrangements that enable you to do as you did before. That hasn't happened in the UK. The, the other problem further to this is the EU was trying to stop the dumping of cheaper Chinese steel um, within the EU to protect um, EU-based steel makers, um, and the UK was against it. You know, the UK, I think, has changed the rules around importing cheaper Chinese steel as well. Um, so the UK was, it, it seems more than happy to let this industry die, honestly. Um, you know, I'm sure Jacob rees Morgan and his will say, like, well, if we can import it cheaper, why would we bother? Even though steel is a key um, part of kind of infrastructure and another kind of, um, uh, another kind of um, manufactured goods um, and, and services, things like that. I'm struggling for words a bit here, but point being is like we, we need steel for, for for the country. Like steel is a very important resource. And what's making it worse is that uh, businesses now are, are thinking, well, what happens if the Conservative Party takes a far more hard line view in terms of Brexit? What does that mean in terms of our business model? All that uncertainty makes the UK a more difficult place in which to invest. It is an. I guess yeah, you know, I guess it'd be the idea of well, if the UK is not, if if the UK government aren't going to save steel, what other industries are they going to allow to die? Inevitable that if there are barriers put up between one market and another, that's not going to help uh, somebody selling into that second market. And that's what we've seen recently, of course. I think the uncertainty surrounding Brexit, the uncertainty in terms of the future, the civil war that's taking place inside the Conservative Party, all these things are factors that any business that's looking to export to the EU will take into account when deciding to invest in the UK. I think the there's obviously the labor shortage we have here as well, especially in skilled areas. Um, there is the increased electricity costs we have versus EU countries. Um, you know, when it came to offering Jaguar a deal to set up shop in Spain, I don't think Spain even offered any subsidies. It was just their electricity costs were that much cheaper than ours. They didn't have to offer anything. Um, in the end, they cho Tata chose, um, I think Tata's the company that owns Jaguar, they chose the UK because we offered fat stacks of subsidies, more socialism to them. The, the, one of the problems is the UK government is not interested in the steel industry. If we see the responses that have been made over the past few days, they're nonchalant. They are uh, apathetic. I know, for example, that the current First Minister has said he's been trying to get a meeting with colleagues in London. That hasn't happened. They Especially with the First Minister changing, because I think Drakeford, uh, Drakeford resigned. So 
Um, I'm not sure who it would be now, uh, First Minister. I don't know if they've chosen anyone yet. They just seem to be sitting back and doing nothing. And I think people will judge them on that. Yes, they're not directly closing the plant, as Margaret Thatcher did with the mines, but they're sitting back and allowing this to happen. And people, I don't think, will accept that. It's the bit in Batman where uh, Batman says to Raish, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm not going to save you either. And, you know, that's what the UK government have said to the steel industry. We're not going to destroy you, but we're not going to save you. And that's it. It's finished. Has anyone else from the mainstream media asked you these questions in the last 20 minutes? I think at the moment the focus has been on the immediate issues. So you're saying none of the journalists have asked you about what has caused this yet? No. So byline kind of flexing a bit there, but you know they've done a good work. They've actually spoken to one of the workers there and asked their opinions. Um, they've spoken to a person who would know um, about the lay of the land, really. Um, someone who was involved with politics, um, especially during the kind of key years of it. Um, and we've got some answers here so this is why it's important to support uh journalists that you like you know and i'm not talking i'm not a journalist i'm a, a pundit or at best i'm an analyst if you want to call me that but what byline do um and they haven't been that active but i think they're starting to come back a bit now um is actually go to these areas which cost money it costs money to go there it costs money to do these interviews and things like that not like paying the person but um location all that kind of stuff so um yeah you know if you can support them um do so because um you know me making this video is easy but them actually physically going to these locations is not so um support people who do uh, you know actual journalism you know first-hand reporting they are some of the most important people within the media probably the most important people in the media uh, but anyways i'm gonna leave it there let me know what you think in the comments below like comment share subscribe support the channel on patreon if you can and hopefully i'll see you in the next one